Sure, yeah, a little, a little something different for you this evening. So one of them will be sort of a grammar thing, and I'm not actually going to go very far or very deep with the grammar, but uh, I would like just to look at something that I think is a matter of perspective that you'll always need when you read the Word of God. Okay? And so let's go ahead and read Proverbs chapter 25, and I would like to go uh, down to, not verse 24, uh, but verse 22. For you that are hoping that we just have to be another day. Uh, verse 21, actually. <laughs> Got to say it wrong at least once. Proverbs 25, 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And then our text tonight. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Well, we'll pray now. Father, please help us as we study the Scripture, or to be circumspect, help us to be careful of just notions or conceived ideas that we have, which would distract us from the important truths that are in the Scripture, and help us not to be, over, be uh, overlooking important truth either. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try to calm myself down just a little bit. I'm keyed up tonight. Some Sunday nights that just happens to me, and I can't quite explain it. It isn't as though I had coffee this afternoon or anything like that. Matter of fact, I had not too much coffee this morning, actually uh, less than a pot, and Anthony didn't make it. So uh, not, not, not so much, but uh, I think it was Caleb. I think Caleb just came in, wound up this morning, and he wound me up. And so... I've always blamed the children, and I'll continue to do so until it doesn't work anymore. So, there you go. But Caleb is wound up today as well. We both are wound up. So don't be too hard on him. Uh, well, I guess you can be hard on him, but you can't be hard on me. It's not really fair. So, there you go. <laughs> First, uh, I'd like to look at this passage of Scripture. And uh, <laughs> how many of you have heard this, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he be thirsty give him water to drink, and then for thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. How many of you have heard the traditions behind the coals of fire on their head? In other words, the explanation for what it means to heap coals of fire on someone's head. Mrs. Price, you have, Lee, you have. Okay, give me, give me some of those definitions. Charlie, yes. What does it mean? Okay, the coals to start for fire. Okay, so back in the day when Proverbs was written, the poor people traveled around with coals in their pockets just in case they needed to start a fire. And uh, so one of the worst things you could have happen back when people lived in caves and had barely discovered fire was to uh, <laughs> be out somewhere and have your fire go out. And one of the things that you might need from a neighbor would be to go over and get a coal from his fire so you could start yours to cook or to keep warm. How many has heard that? Something like that. Okay. Uh, the only problem with that, I, I, I like it. I mean, I, I remember being in high school and having my, I think it was my high school principal, give that one for an explanation and somebody explained that to him. He'd said, you know, sometimes we read Proverbs chapter 20 and we think, you know, a good way to get back at your neighbor is, or at your enemy, not your neighbor, you have both, you know, neighbor or enemy. A good way to get back at your enemy is when he does something wrong for you, then you just treat him well. And if he's hungry, give him food. And if he's thirsty, give him drink. And basically, he'll burn his head off. You know, it's the one way. Is, and that's the way my principal put it. Is, you know, the worst thing that, that could ever happen to you is have somebody that you hate be kind to you. You know, it just bothers you. Well, you know, that, um, that may, may be true. Um, matter of fact, it seems as though if that's... Uh, more literally the sense of what the scripture is saying than the, you know, people carried, I heard something about they carried coals on their head, like they had a thing, a, you know, a piece of pottery or something, and they would carry coals on their head. And so that was the tradition, you know, if you care. Now, I don't know who in their right mind would put fire on top of their head, uh, but if they did, it's small wonder they don't do it anymore. Uh, probably Geico cut them. On their insurance and they got forced insurance with you know Florida's what's the citizens or something like that and it's definitely an insurance catastrophe for sure and it's a hairdresser's nightmare 
Okay. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that there's just no historical basis for that. There are so, quite a few things, actually, that um, I've heard and, and parroted or that uh, I've heard others say, and I've been fortunate enough not to parrot, but there are a number of things in the Bible that just aren't true. For instance, how many of you have ever heard this one? Uh, in the Old Testament, when the priest went into the Holy of Holies, they would attach a chain to his ankle. And that way, if he died in the Holy of Holies, because nobody could go in there, then they would pull him out with the chains. You know, there is no corroboration for that in any of the rabbinical writings or any of the historical writings. It's just not true. What's its origin? Well, somebody had it, like, thought it up, imagined it. Like, you know what? How would be a good way to get a priest out if he died in the Holy of Holies? Well, you know, we could put a chain on their ankle. And somebody preached it, and it became like doctrine and law. It's sort of like the camel through an eye of a needle. There are a lot of these things in the Bible that just make for great preaching, but they have no biblical or historical basis. And that's another one of them. And so there are quite a few of these, and this would be another one of those passages of scriptures that I would challenge anyone to show me where in any contemporary writing of, of the day or in any historical, even rabbinical commentary or so forth, that that's what heaping coals of fire on their head means because it just is so, just is not corroborated. And I hate to burst people's bubbles because some of these stories make for wonderful preaching and a lot of fun. But you know one of the things that I find to be problematic about some of these things is that oftentimes because they make such great preaching we forget that they have no really doctrinal basis and we have have literally our souls stirred and our uh, hearts warmed about something that just God didn't give. <laughs> God didn't say. And you know something, we don't come to church honestly to be inspired uh, for the sake of inspiration, do we? Because we don't come because we want... Uh, it, isn't it great when you hear truth and it thrills your heart? But we don't come here just for a thrill. We could ride a roller coaster for that. Factually, couldn't we? We're not here just to be entertained, although entertainment's not, not evil in and of itself. It can be a tool to support the truth or help the truth. Sometimes truth is entertaining. But that isn't the goal, that isn't the purpose. And sometimes preaching, unfortunately, seems as though that's the end it's trying to perform. It's trying to entertain or thrill or inspire. Uh, and that is because people like it. I have for years wrestled, not literally, I don't think you could literally wrestle with Joel Osteen. He would probably, you know, wither away or something. But I have for years wrestled with Joel Osteen, with... What is it that people see in the guy? I had a lady, and I, man, if I ever wanted to slap a lady, this is the one time in my life. I preached a wedding one time, and a lady came up and says, you know, that was just wonderful. You are such a great speaker. You know, you remind me of Joel Osteen. She said that to me. I checked to see if I had a mullet, you know, back here. And I you know, went and looked in a mirror, and I, I listened to a sound recording to to find out if somehow I'd gone effeminate or something, and I couldn't find any of those things. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really think I have anything in common, but she meant it as a, as a compliment, dear lady, and uh, I've never spoken to her again. Never really, actually. <laughs> I'm kidding you about that. It is, it isn't true, but that lady really did tell me that at my brother's wedding of all places. Ruin my day. Anyway, <laughs> but I've always wondered, what is it about Joel Osteen? Why do people like Joel Osteen? Why do, why do when I knock on a door and somebody says, you know what, I'm Roman Catholic, I was baptized in the Catholic Church, so I'm not Christian, but I'm, old, but I, but, you know, uh, I'm positive about Christianity. I watch Joel Osteen, they try to find a connection, a connecting point. You know, I, I listen to Joel Osteen, I've, I don't know how many times people have told me that, and I've always wondered, why do people like Joel Osteen? Well, because... He tells them positive, thrilling <laughs> things that make them feel good. Yeah. And you know, there are positive, thrilling things in the Bible that honestly make me feel good. I feel pretty good when I read the outcome of the whole good versus evil thing. You know? I, I, Jesus won. Jesus won. The cross finalized everything. And it wasn't just that Jesus was going to win, but it's finished. It's done. I mean, it just thrills me. By itself. I could just come up and say, it is finished. Somebody I'll say amen. 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 It is finished. Amen. amen. Right? I could preach an it is finished message. It is finished. 
it is finished! And we ought to feel it, right? We ought to feel it, thrill it, all those things. Understand that. It feels good to feel good, doesn't it? Messages aren't always to have the purpose of knocking us down. And so I understand the desire to have neat um, or unique messages for the sake of actually uh, throwing the hearer or making people want to hear or, or be actually being impressed enough to come back the next time. Like, oh, I never heard that before. I think, you know, that's neat. You know, that's fine. But this is a passage of Scripture that literally pretty much means what it says, and that is that if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him water to drink, and so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And literally it means, you know, you do good, you'll basically burn your neighbor's head off, or your enemy's, I keep saying neighbor, you'll basically burn his head off. In other words, the explanation is in Proverbs chapter 20. Look at it. You see it? In verse 22, it says... Uh, uh, yeah, it says, The Lord shall reward thee. The Lord shall reward thee. To whom does vengeance belong? God. God. To whom alone does vengeance belong? Who? God. When is it okay for man to take the matter of vengeance upon himself? Never. 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 Ever. That's a pretty hard pill to swallow, actually. It's a pretty tough one. Until you get to know God. Until you come to the place when you recognize that, you know what, God's got vengeance handled. Uh, he, he has it handled, handily handled. No individual who's ever wronged you escapes the wrong. You say, Pastor, was a Christian. They're not even going to get to go to hell. And they did that to me. And, you know, you kind of cloaked in that statement is the notion that it might satisfy you some if they got just a little fire. The reality of it, though, is that, you know, I don't think any of us would actually get the hellfire for anybody, would we? No, no but we want, kind of want them to hurt a little bit. And um, Jesus died on the cross for their sin. They didn't get away with a thing. Christ suffered for it. There's nothing unrevenged. Nothing any man has ever done goes without being avenged. God's got it handled. Better than that, in addition to that, God can take care of your need for revenge. God can take care of your need for revenge. I've said it before, genetically, I think the Price family has a propensity toward revenge more than anybody I've ever met. Uh, <laughs> I have to stop my thoughts because I can just think up ways of getting back at people. Not really getting back at people, I mean getting people. You know, because they never did anything like what you do to them after they did something to you. We're just revengeful. It's, it's genetic. I think we all are that way, but I like to joke that the Price family is especially so. <laughs> and actually, I, I was talking to my brother about this a while back. Of course, he agrees with me, but he, he said some things additionally. He said, actually, no. He said, the prices are very, very revengeful. He said, but the Thelmans take it to a whole other level. And the Thelmans are my mom's side of the family. He says, the Thelmans never forget anything, ever, and they really don't. I thought it was just my mom, but then I found out it was my aunt and my uncle and my his uncle and, and uh, you know, everybody in the Thelman family. They don't forget anything ever. I mean, ever. Not anything bad, that is. And it's, it's genetic for me, so I'm Bryce Thelman. And uh, I've got some in it. Hey, listen. Listen, that's funny if I, if I don't act on it, right? It's, it's humorous that uh, that's where we come from. But the reality of it is, is that God takes care of me. And not, not in the sense that God satisfies me that He hurts people enough that I'm happy about it. But I'm just saying God takes care of me. God fixes me. And here's what I found to be true. I found that when I give water to those that are thirsty, when I give food to those that are hungry, though they be my enemy, I found that I began to have the mind of Christ. See, everyone who is dead in their trespasses and sins is the enemy of God. So anything, anyone God does anything for is His enemy. Does God do good things for the wicked so that 
he can wreak havoc and revenge on them? Or is it so that he can be merciful and long-suffering and compassionate toward them? See, when I act this way, I begin to get the mind of Christ. You know, it's a cliche, but it's true. They say that if you have somebody that you can't stand, try praying for them. You're not praying imprecatory prayers as Charlie would teach us, but simply pray uh, for their good. Right, Charlie? You agree with me on this, don't you, Charlie? Okay. All right. Uh, they actually pray for your enemy and pray, pray for the things they need. I mean, I'll tell you what, all of a sudden you start praying for your enemy and you're honestly praying for them, being honest about it. God knows your heart, so there's no point pretending anyway. But you're honestly praying for them and you honestly start thinking about what their needs are. And when you start to see your enemy as needy, you begin to have compassion for them. You know, you've got a guy who's starving or thirsty and he's your enemy. Um, you might be able to relate a little bit to where he's coming from and what he's doing. That guy stole from you and he's starving. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. That's what the Bible says. And all of a sudden you begin to see things from a different perspective. And the Bible says God will keep, keep coals of fire on their head. And truthfully, when God does so, many times I've been brought to the place where I've said, you know, God, I don't have a, I don't have a, a dog in this fight. Uh, it's okay with me if you just go ahead and, and let the cross cover that for them. And I don't need anything. I don't need any vengeance on that person. And I realize that uh, I am deserving. I'm deserving of God's judgment. I'm deserving of coals of fire on my head. And uh, I don't really want that for me. And I don't really honestly wish that for anyone else either. And so God fixes us. And that's actually what Proverbs is teaching here. And I think it's far more helpful than the burn their head off, or the which is closest to accurate, or the, you know, Carry fire around on top of your head, and if your neighbor needs a coal, hook them up. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how dumb people think God is. And I, I don't mean to be mean about that, but I mean honestly, couldn't God have come up with a better illustration if He intended to say something like, you know, the, the Bible's not locked into not locked into mere tradition. There are things we can understand the Bible better from understanding the culture, but it's not limited simply to tradition. Okay, there's a second thing that I want to teach uh, today from Proverbs chapter 25. Let's go to Romans to learn it. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. <laughs> this is a series of uh, terse commands. By terse, I don't mean rude. I just mean kind of just standalone statements, in many ways much like Proverbs. Proverbs uh, has some paragraphs in it, but much of Proverbs is actually standalone statements, just wise Proverbs, wise sayings. And in many ways, Romans chapter 12 is much like that because it is the Apostle Paul, after having talked about how that Israel is going to be saved and God's future plan for Israel and how that the Jews and the Greeks all uh, belong as in, in the church and how they're to be in form and function one with another. After Paul's gotten done explaining that, now he's just giving some behaviors. We know Proverbs 12, 1 and 2, I, I uh, uh, beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds. And a lot of statements like that. Another statement like, be ye kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Just a lot of statements that just stand as a concept alone with behaviors that are required. Now look down to verse uh, 16. The Bible says recompense. Recompense is a word that just means to, to, to give a repayment for. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Promise, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And then a, another statement which is not the same but similar. Dearly beloved, avenge yourselves. Aven I'm sorry, we better add this. be like the wicked Bible where the Bible says, uh, where the printing said, thou shalt commit adultery instead of thou shalt not commit adultery. We need that not there, so let's get it in there. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, uh, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. And I'd like you uh, all to read the next four words together. Do you see it there? It begins with the conjunction, gar or for. For it is written. Let's say it again together. 
for it is written. You know what's written. Uh, Vengeance is mine, I repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, thine enemy hunger, feed him if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And we see that it is written, references Proverbs chapter 25, verse 22. <laughs> Well, you say, Pastor, I don't know the significance for that. I don't understand the significance of it. Well, it's a separate message from the one we just learned. It's not saying anything differently. Uh, it is reaffirming what Proverbs 25 said, and that is that we are not to take vengeance upon ourselves. Vengeance belongs to God. And if we do it God's way, then God will heap coals of fire on our enemy's head. And uh, that's we're not to be overcome of evil, but, uh, let, but have... Uh, overcome evil with good. And so these are the things that the Bible says it is written about. Now, I don't know if it captures your attention much the same way that it does me, but I find it interesting that individuals try to teach about the Proverbs, that they are wise sayings, but that they are not uh, bearing the same scriptural authority as the rest <laughs> of the Bible. Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> I have many times said to people, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Well, pastor, I understand the principle behind that, but you have to understand that in moderation, wine isn't always bad. And that's just a proverb. You ever heard that's just a proverb? And so it is not the Scripture? Well, let me just say this. The Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. And the same people that would say the first about something like wine or disciplining your child or... Here's, a, here's one. Train up your child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. I don't know how many people tell me that doesn't mean what it says. It says that. That's an axiom. Uh, it's more of an axiom, not a, it's more of a proverb. And it's, it's not a promise, it's an axiom, which means that basically sometimes it's true, it's generally true, but it's not always true. And actually, that the people that don't believe it's true, it's more untrue than it is true normally in actual practice. And that's not, not trying to be mean, but it's actually, that's the fact. Okay, so uh, Proverbs 22, 6, though, says, Train up a child the way should go, and his old and not depart from it. It would be wonderful to have that promise if you did, if you taught a child right, that they'd turn out right, wouldn't it? But uh, actually, it doesn't mean what it says, because it's only a proverb. Is that funny? Okay. All right, it's because it's only a proverb. So, now, the Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So people say, well, it's not really Scripture, it's a proverb. Well, Scripture it comes with the word grafe, grafo, I write, or it's written, or, it, or you know, write, a writing, I should say. And um, so what they say is, well, you know, it's just talking about generally things that are written. Now, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. It would be a tragedy, wouldn't it, if some of the Scripture wasn't as profitable as others, or some of it wasn't as true as others? When the Bible talks about the Word of God being perfect, actually the same word that we find in our text in Romans chapter 12 is also written about the words of, the, of God are pure words. And it's the word gigrapto. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the word grapho, and it is in the uh, third person, uh, perfect tense, and uh, it is a formula when it's used that carries with it the idea of the perfect in the Greek. We don't have a perfect in the English language. And so the King James translators did a lot better job than any other version uh, translator of the Scripture because they really had a better understanding of the English language. And so they used the right formula of words to say it is written. In other words, they wrote it in the present tense, but it was in the past tense, past perfect tense in the Greek language. Meaning it has been written, but it's in the perfect in the Greek. And the perfect in the, in, in the Greek, it means it has continuing results. That is, it was written and it is still written. Do you understand the difference? In other words, we could say in the past it was written in the English language. That's what we understand. The perfect in the English language doesn't carry that same notion that the, that the Greek language does. Uh, in the present tense, we'd say it is written. It is written or it is being written. But that would expire at a certain point because the present would no longer be present at, when the future comes. So it would become past. We have past, present, future. The Greek language has past perfect, which carries with it the idea of what we call punctiliar results. In other words, uh, punctiliar uh, would be like a punctuation, like if you were to take a point, 
and put a dot there. If you have, if you could imagine with me a timeline, and, and maybe the timeline starts with creation, goes maybe uh, to the fall of man, shows the flood, shows uh, shows God's covenant with Abraham, shows Egypt, shows you know it goes through the timeline of events that are significant through the world. And if you were to go to a certain point in the timeline during the giving of the law uh, or after the giving of the law, and there's a timeline of King Solomon and God using him in a supernatural way to give wisdom. And King Solomon wrote Proverbs. And that's the point. That's the pinpoint. We say punctiliar. That's the point at which it was written. So it was written, but it is said that it is written. Why is it written? Well, because it's still written. In other words, it's written in the past with continual results. It's a continuous, it's a continuous uh, concept, even though it is in the original language, it is written. Here's what Wallace says about it, not you care about too, too much about uh, Daniel Wallace, but he's quite a grammarian, and he's not right about everything, but this is something he, he explains pretty well. He says, this common introductory formula to Old Testament quotations seems to be used to emphasize that the written word still exists. In other words, it's still written. And he says, although just beyond the reach of grammar, the exegetical and theological significance of this seems to be, in light of how it is used in the New Testament, that of present and binding authority. In other words, it still is, is as true, it was true, and it is true. Uh, in other words, Gagrapti could often be paraphrased thus, although this scripture was written long ago, its authority <coughs> is still binding on us. And he says that's a very loose paraphrase, but that's the notion of Gagrapti in the Scripture. It's interesting to me that actually if you were to read uh, Grant Wallace's grammar in this section, he's not a guy that actually uses the right version of, of the Bible. He uh, uses modern translations because he buys into the textual criticism notion that the, receipt, that the, church, the text that the church has always used uh, you know, is, is an inferior text. And I think that's just an area where he, as much as he knows about grammar, he just doesn't understand. But he says in one of his paragraphs about this truth of it being written, and I'm paraphrasing Wallace, he says something to the effect of, uh, you know, unfortunately, because the grammarians in the day of the King James being written, uh, because they were at the zenith of the English language when the Shakespearean uh, writers were all writing, and when there was really a lot of a, a really great understanding of the English language, he says it was translated best in the King James Version because of the writers in the Elizabethan period having a better education about the English language, and so their rendering of it as written is much better than the rendering of the NAS or the NIV or other texts like that. And I just think it's ironic that he uses those texts and believes that, which is funny to me. Uh, I will say that he defends himself to his defense. It's not a good defense, but this is his perspective. And I'm not preaching about Daniel Wallace tonight. Don't have anything against the guy. But I will say that he believes that Greek grammarians know more about Greek today than they did back in the 1600s, in the 1500s. And uh, I am a little bit of a skeptic about that, just knowing the education being what it is today. I don't think and it's possible, but it, there really has been a lot of a grammar advancement made uh, for the use of programs. I can actually write a grammar by just doing uh, uh, morphological, uh, using a morphological assistant and just, just running checks. Like I could put a structure, grammatical structure, and find out, okay, it's always used this way, or it's never used this way, or it's used this way and this way. This is the range of meaning. And I can use a computer to do what it used to be. A grammar professor used to have you know, 50 students combing the Bible trying to find that construction, and it would take them a couple of years to get through it. I can do it like that by just clicking a button and do the same kind of a search because of uh, advancements in technology. But I do not think that we're getting smarter. I think we're getting dumber overall, unfortunately. I don't think technology is making us wiser. I think that technology is giving us, in many cases, not every case, but it's a crutch that we lean on instead of actually using our brains to the degree that we could. Okay, now you say, Pastor, what's the significance of this? Well, that is the significance of this. I think it's ironic that of all of the individuals who could have done so, that the Holy Spirit of God used the Apostle Paul, who was the premier grammarian in the New Testament.
other words, the Apostle Paul was the scholar. I mean, he's the guy that it made sense that he's that he uh, defended and argued a lot of points. He would have been the scholar about of the Old Testament, a scholar about Judaism. He would have been, of course, the scholar as far as education goes, more so than any of the other writers. And it's ironic that of all the people that were to quote Proverbs saying, it is written, that is, it was written, and it is still written, because it's the Scripture that God used the Apostle Paul to do so. Why, why is that such a significant deal? Well, because more than 67 times in the New Testament, Gregoraptai is, 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 uh, is used. And what does that give us the indication of? Well, it gives us the indication of the reality that God's eternal word was given perfectly and is still perfect. In other words, it was given exactly the way God intended and it has existing results. My friend, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And it is written, <clears throat> indicates the same. And I just want to say to you, you can go ahead and grab Proverbs. You can open up your Bible and you can read it with the confidence that it is the Scripture. It's not just some wisdom that's true in some instances, but it is practical and applicable, and I hope that's a help for you tonight. Father, thank you for what we learned. I pray that you would help us to apply and live. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.